Hey everyone, just a quick message here before we begin. For those of you who are fans of my animation series, I just launched a brand new YouTube channel for my character Jamie. Very soon, we're going to start releasing music covers that are sung by her. The first two songs are going to be covers of the songs Fool's Holiday by the pop punk band All Time Low and the classic All I Want for Christmas by Mariah Carey. So either check the little annotation on the top of the screen or check the pinned comment of this video or the video description. With that said, let's get started with this mega collection episode of all the school lockdown and scary school related stories that we've covered here on the Creepy Fox. Enjoy. Don't people say school is supposed to be just as safe as your home? A location where you not only learn, but create everlasting memories? Oh boy, everlasting memories were created, and one in particular stands out from the rest. Now, this might not seem like a big deal, but just think of the context of not knowing what might happen next. I forget exactly which year it was but I want to say it was either junior or senior year of high school. From my memory, I recall we were watching a movie in one of my science classes when we were suddenly interrupted by a student who entered the classroom. He was out of breath, and everybody just looked at him funny. Finally, he just decided to point out the window, and the teacher goes to see what had caused the scare. She lets out a gasp, and then grabs the room key and locks the door. Some students, including myself, start to look out the window, and that's when we see it. There was a man trying to open some doors, and he's got a hold of what looks to be like a machete. This was confirmed when the student who had run into a room says that they were just walking out of the restroom when they heard somebody mumbling. They then see the man with a machete who looked as if he was drunk. That leads us to these moments. Well, it turned out some other students and teachers had spotted him, because when we see our teacher reach for the phone, the school's alarm system starts to ring. That ring, wow, let me tell you, you can't forget it. It might seem basic, but when you know the meaning behind it, which we were taught was to be used only during a lockdown, it gave you nightmares. Anyway, all the students are freaking out, naturally, and all our teacher could do is remind us to remain quiet and wait for the all clear to be given. It felt like an eternity, and it was made worse when we could hear somebody try to open the door. It was the man. How did we know? We could see him through the cracks of the blinds. He tried kicking at the door shortly after, but we see him walk off less than 15 seconds later, heading toward the high school's baseball field, which happened to be in our line of view. Anyway, five minutes later we saw at least 20 police officers, some in SWAT gear, head toward the baseball field. Then 15 minutes later, a couple of police officers reach our classroom and tells us it's safe to head outside. The school day was cancelled, and I met up with my parents who, like you might have imagined, were worried sick. Luckily, if there was one positive to the experience, they treated me to some Baskin Robbins ice cream. Now, the part of the story where the man was caught was later relayed to us the following day, but here's what happened. The man who walked onto our campus was indeed drunk, his companion in his misadventures, that machete. Police officers found him trying to break into a shed where the PE teachers kept all the sporting goods. Apparently the man didn't give a fight, which made things much more smooth. So there you have it, my high school lockdown story. This happened a long time ago, as in the early 1990s. I was a junior in high school, which meant I would be allowed to walk off campus for lunch. This was allowed only for juniors and seniors, and it's something my friends and I took huge advantage of. Normally, we were only given 30 minutes for our lunch, but we would always give some sort of excuse saying we got stuck at a red light or the food was taking too long. Hey, the teachers believed it, so why not? Now, the nice thing was our high school was just a five minute walk away from a junior college, which side note, I actually attended that college two years later. Anyway, the reason why I bring this up is because myself and some friends would go there to the cafeteria as their food was way better than the one they served at our high school. For example, the junior college had a Taco Bell, round table pizza, and a Carl's Jr. 
On top of the recognized fast food chains, there was a small arcade in the basement that featured Street Fighter, Pac-Man, and there was even a bowling alley. Cool, right? Sure, so long as nothing too scary happens. But like I mentioned, myself and some buddies walked over to the community college and sat down at some tables chowing down on our food. I remember we tried to think of an excuse we could give the teachers as it seemed they were catching up to our tricks. Suddenly, we're interrupted by an alarm, followed by a message over the intercom system. It's telling all the students to shelter in place and to try blocking any entryways. We were confused until some staff walked into the area and told us to remain quiet and vigilant. Now, I remind you once again that this is the 90s, so we have no way of checking our cell phones for any sort of updates on social media or even notifications from this school. We were in the dark, quite literally, as the staff inside the cafeteria area turns the lights off and everybody starts whispering, trying to come up with some sort of explanation. I remember hearing helicopters flying over the campus and even the sounds of police sirens. After about half an hour, another announcement is made over the intercom system, announcing the end of the lockdown. Once we exited the building, my group of friends and I could see a huge line of news reporters and police officers who we assumed were trying to get answers to their questions. We avoided them and returned to campus, but we were in for quite a scolding. I'll go ahead and explain it. First off, the reason for the lockdown. Turned out there was a police chase, and the would-be robbers stopped in the back parking structure of the community college, and then made their run for it on the campus. Some students even saw them, which made the whole thing that much more creepier. The second part we learned was our high school went on a soft lockdown as a precaution. This is the point our teacher noticed we were missing. He called the principal's office, who then notified the police. Now, I did say we got quite a scolding, but it was more so with a concerned type of tone. The school was just happy we were safe, and nobody was hurt. So that was the time I went on a lunch break that took a very scary and surprising turn. I will never forget the scary evening of December 12th, 2012. It was a night I would soon never forget, and it's a reminder of how anything can happen. What I'm about to tell you is 100% true, and it comes from myself, an eyewitness. You can even look up the incident if you don't believe me. So I'll describe the incident, and I'll even go into detail with how it started, including the outcome. So, I was studying at Cal State Fullerton in Southern California, and it was your average, ordinary day. Students were sitting around campus talking with friends, studying for finals, where I found myself in Mahalo Hall, a building where most of the business majors spend time at. Inside Mahalo Hall, there's a Starbucks, and that's where I was sitting at. There I was, drinking a coffee, reading one of my online textbooks, and it's around 3.30 p.m., that's when I remember my friend Julia texting me. She said, Hey, if you're bored, there's a police chase on TV. Funny enough, it's not too far from campus. Now, I know it sounds cruel, but how many of you are guilty for watching police chases live on TV? Show of hands, be honest. Yeah, that's what I thought. I texted her back saying that indeed I wasn't home and I was studying at school, and then I told her to provide me with updates just for curiosity. Well, little did I know this curiosity would soon come knocking, quite literally 15 minutes later. Fast forward with those 15 minutes and I started to hear sirens. Not sirens from a fire alarm, mind you, but from the police. I tried not to pay attention to it as I really needed to get work done, but it became apparent that something was up when some of the students inside the Starbucks got up and started staring out the window. So I go ahead and look up and sure enough, we can see five men running in all directions. One was caught by officers and one started running to our building. The other three head across the street. The man running into Mahalo Hall enters and it soon becomes apparent what was happening. The police chase my friend had mentioned had stopped just outside our campus. The culprits, you guessed it, they were here. But here's the thing. We honestly thought that he was going to start firing off gunshots, but he sort of just runs off heading further into campus. Moments later, 
Police storm Mahalo Hall and they're saying, which direction did he go in? Students started pointing to the exit of Mahalo Hall and about 10 cops go running after him. Now, before continuing on with what happens next, including what I had to go through, let me tell you about what started this mess. An hour earlier in the city of Moreno Valley, five men in ski masks stormed a pawn shop and they took everything they could. They were armed, which makes the whole situation that much more scarier. The team gets into a vehicle and leads the police on a wild chase. That's when almost an hour later they found themselves on our campus. So anyway, back to me. After seeing this crazy event unfolding right before me, I was left in shock, but also with the realization I was going to be late for my class. So I put my laptop away, throw my coffee out, and I make my way to the third story. Mind you, I'm still in the same building. As I'm heading upstairs, police officers are shouting and telling everybody to head into a room and to lock themselves in place. This was now turning into a lockdown, and it became even scarier when I hear students running into the building with panic in their voice, saying that the man that ran onto campus had a gun. Well, I make it to my classroom, where myself and about 70 other students spend the next few hours waiting in suspense. The whole time, the campus is updating us with text messages, telling us every little detail. Things such as, Remain calm, keep all the doors closed, and don't open the door for anyone. Make sure to keep all the lights off, and put as much as you can between the door and yourselves. Reading those text messages was some of the scariest stuff ever. So you might be wondering what did we do as we waited. Well, as we sat around on our phones huddling together, we began to come up with a plan if things were to go wrong. After a while, however, the SWAT team was able to get us out and I left campus being welcomed by my mom and dad, who were crying tears of joy. Mind you, I was updating them with every little detail and they were watching on the local TV fearing the worst. Sadly for some other students, they were on lockdown until almost midnight as they couldn't find the suspect. The fear was he had changed clothes and blended in with the students, but that wasn't the case. The man ended up getting away. So yes, a real life scary ordeal that I hope no one ever has to go through. Like I mentioned, if you want more information, you can look up Cal State Fullerton 2012 lockdown and it should be one of the first links you see. Anyway, that's my personal experience. Stay safe, friends, and take care. Occurring back in the late 2000s, I was going to community college to try and save myself some money. Most of my friends went to university right after high school, but I was that different dude, the one who couldn't decide on whether he just wanted to go to work or maybe at least get an associate's degree. I did get that associate's degree, and I landed a job doing inspections of buildings, but that's not really important to what I'm here to tell you all about. It all started when I had arrived to my English lecture. It was early as usual, and I met up with a fellow classmate, who for this retelling I'm going to call Christine. I had met her the previous semester in my math class and we got along having similar interests in art. That day of our lecture, had Christine and I joining another three students as the classroom was split up into teams of five for an activity. I forget exactly what we were going over, but all of a sudden my attention is brought to the entrance of the lecture hall. Bear in mind, there are at least a hundred students in here and I barely recognize anyone as it is. I instantly, however, recognized who had entered. It was Christine's obsessive, lack of confidence and protective boyfriend. He was the typical definition of a Chad that most people find annoying. Well, one thing was for certain. He didn't have this class. It's not like he was late to the first day. We were at least two months into the semester, so it's not like he transferred over or something. Anyway, he's looking around the room and that's when he spots both me and Christine. I knew you were hanging out with him. Didn't I tell you to stop talking to him? Now, I'm going to quickly make a quick little detour so I can provide you with some more context with his boyfriend of hers. The only reason I knew he was super insecure and protective was because last semester, when we had that math class, Christine and I were studying in the library. That's when her boyfriend called her and asked her what she was doing. 
She said she was studying with me, and that's when he absolutely lost it. I still remember more or less what words he said since the volume on Christine's phone was kind of loud. Are you kidding me? I can't believe you're cheating on me. Don't tell me it's that kid from your math class. The one you've been talking to. Wait until I get my hands on him. Now I know what you're thinking. This Christine girl is pretty toxic, and I should have just stopped talking to her. I did for a while, but she kept texting me, and it's not like I could have avoided her since we had the same class. Also, she never brought up the boyfriend again, and I never asked about him either, so I assumed he was out of the picture. Anyway, back to when her boyfriend entered the classroom. He walks over to her group and then starts to curse me out. I would rather not repeat the words you said, but let's just say he was a sailor mouth. Christine told her boyfriend he needed to relax and that he was taking everything away out of context. Some other classmates who had no idea about the current situation did actually come to my defense. Even the professor told him he needed to leave. But that's when he does the unthinkable. He reaches into his backpack and no joke, moments later, he takes out a pocket knife. There was an audible gasp as people start to scatter to the other side of the room. Meanwhile, the professor is telling him to drop the knife. I came here to teach this punk a lesson, and nobody is going to stop me. There is one last detail I haven't brought up, mainly because I think it would have spoiled the ending. I am a black belt in martial arts, and I've taken years of self-defense classes. That's why when Christine's boyfriend starts to approach me, I am able to take the knife away from him, albeit I did suffer quite a bit of cuts and scratches. Unfortunately, in my adrenaline rush, it falls out of my grasp due to my sweaty palms, and then it starts falling down the stairs. Christine's boyfriend chases after the falling knife, and then he runs out of the classroom. Everyone sort of just stood there in shock until my professor decides to lock the door. Needless to say, our community college went on lockdown and about 45 minutes later, the campus was cleared. Now, as for Christine's boyfriend, he was later found at his apartment and was arrested for the scare and panic he had caused, as well as for attacking me. After that day, I actually ended up dropping the class, and I completely avoided Christine altogether. Maybe it was an overreaction, but I was scared that he might have come after my family, although that was impossible since he was in a jail cell. The last I heard of Christine came from a mutual friend. I guess she moved out of state and got married with somebody else a few years later. As for that boyfriend I mentioned, not sure where he is today, but I've never seen or heard from him again. Anyone else remember when you were a kid and when Valentine's Day rolled around? You'd get all excited for the candy and treats you'd get at school. I remember those years when my mom and I would go shopping and grab chocolates, candies, and those little valentines cards that come in those boxes you can hand out to your classmates. Now, I know I still have some of them somewhere in a box in my attic, I just need to find them so I can reread some of the messages my friends wrote to me. Now, while I can spend hours talking about all the good times in elementary school, as would anyone else. I want to instead focus on what happened to me in my school on Valentine's Day of 2003. It's a day I will never forget. Obviously, I'm not going to remember the exact dialogues of what everyone said, so understand that this is going to involve some paraphrasing. I also enlisted the help of a friend of mine to assist me with remembering some of the details I missed. We will call her Veronica. She's the only friend from elementary school I still talk to. She remembers this day as well, as she was in the same room as me. So anyway, to skip a lot of boring details, I want to jump to after lunch that day. All of us students had returned back to our classroom and we are now starting the Valentine's Day mini party. We were going around our class, handing out our little goodies and cards, and laughing amongst ourselves. As my teacher sat there at his table, grading some papers, and listening to the music he had playing over his computer. It was about 15 minutes in, and we're all suddenly interrupted by an alarm, followed by a message over the intercom system. We're going into lockdown. This is not a drill. 911 has been called. Please lock all your doors. 
and stay away from any windows. All of us kids are starting to freak out, but in our innocent 6th grader minds, we think that this has to be some sort of sick joke. But it wasn't. My teacher now instructs everybody to get into the back corner of the room as he locks our door, closes the blinds, and shuts down the lights. Naturally, we're all starting to wonder just what exactly is going on as some of the kids start laughing and making jokes of the situation. I think this was their way to cope with the current events that were unfolding. I remember my teacher getting on the phone and after he hung up, we saw the fear in his eyes and we knew that this lockdown wasn't just something innocent. One of the students actually overheard the staff on the phone to mention the word knife to our teacher since she was closest to him. And when we asked him about it, he just responded back with, Yes, but we need to remain quiet and we need to remain calm until the police arrive. About five minutes into the lockdown, one of the kids, for whatever reason, decided to break away from the group that's huddled at the back of the room and now crawls over to peek through the blinds. My teacher, in his hushed voice, is angry and now telling him to come back to us. But what my classmates saw scared him so badly that he immediately ran back in fear trying not to cry. Moments after that, we can see the door handle is beginning to shake and everyone starts to freak out. Don't open the door. He's got a huge knife. It's not the police, our classmate said as my teacher then tries to comfort him and tells him to remain quiet. Moments that seemed to go on for an agonizing eternity that were only maybe less than 15 seconds. The door handle stopped shaking and we all start to let out sighs of relief, at least for now. A few minutes later, we are able to hear the sounds of police sirens and even the sound of a helicopter above. I guess the whole police station had been called in. Needless to say, after a total of 45 horrifying minutes filled with anxiety and fear, the lockdown is lifted and a police officer comes to our door to let us all out. By now, the school is filled with everyone's parents, including mine, who couldn't stop crying and thanking the heavens above that I and everyone else were safe. So anyway, here's the lowdown on what happened. It turned out that a guy who was on drugs and completely off his rockers was walking around the nearby neighborhoods with a large hunting knife. He just so happened to have walked onto our campus and one of the hall monitors ended up noticing him. She immediately ran into a nearby room to notify the front office who then called the police and issued the lockdown. It's just so scary to think that we were all involved in such a crazy incident. But if there was one good thing, no one, including the drugged up guy, were hurt. Well, I think they did end up tasing him from what I heard, but that was the least of his troubles. Years have now gone by, and any time I think about elementary school, that event sticks out to me the most. Really just goes to show you that anything can happen, even on Valentine's Day. This was in February of 2008, when I was a junior in high school. The day had started like any other, regretting staying up the previous night playing video games. If you're familiar with this time period, then you'll know Call of Duty 4 had just been released a few months prior. All the students at my school admittedly played it until the late hours of the night. This was why I was super tired and my eyes were red most of the day. I couldn't even pay attention and it's surprising how I made it to each of my classes on time. Anyway, during fifth period chemistry class, which was right after lunch, I asked the teacher if I could go use the restroom. Normally she was very strict and would only let you go if you used one of your five bathroom passes, which were handed out at the beginning of the semester. If any of you had bathroom passes and you're listening now, then you're a real OG. I had none. But surprisingly, she was feeling extra generous, and she allowed me five minutes to go and pee. Here's when things got crazy. You see, in order to get to the closest restroom, I had to go down this long hallway. It takes you about 20 seconds to reach the end if you're at a normal walking pace. Once you're at the end, you're met with the main area of the school, 
where all the popular students hung out during lunch, as well as our two assigned 15 minute breaks. Anyway, I walked to my left for about 10 seconds. There is the restroom. As I'm looking at my phone, not paying attention to my surroundings, I ended up bumping into someone, which caused me to fall flat on my butt. Me already being grumpy from the lack of sleep expels some not so kind language, and that's when I can see it. In front of me was a gun in someone's hand. I froze as my eyes slowly rose higher, being met with a complete stranger in a ski mask. He also had a large duffel bag. Here's the thing, he wasn't alone. Another person with similar attire and mask, also with a handgun, was standing beside him. I was really expecting to bite the dust right there and then and get shot, but these men just run past me, heading down the hallway. I remember sitting there scared out of my mind, but more importantly, confused to what had just happened. Was it possible some seniors were filming for their end of year school projects? It was possible, but I saw no cameras. Also, I'm pretty sure you would get expelled or even arrested if you brought a prop pistol. Well, as I start to stand up, five police officers come running in my direction, telling me to get to a safe area. All I did was point in the direction of where I saw the armed men, and they chase after them. Meanwhile, I run into the restroom and hide in the bathroom stall. Within seconds, there's an announcement over the school's speaker system, and it's telling all teachers, staff, and students to take cover and lock themselves in place. I must have been in that restroom for at least 20 minutes. Meanwhile, I was texting my friends who were in a different class. They told me their teachers had turned off all the lights. They barricaded the doors with chairs and tables. After what felt like an eternity, an all-clear message is announced over the speakers, and I ended up stepping out of the restroom. Students and staff were starting to walk out of their classrooms, heading toward the main area I mentioned earlier. I soon met up with my classmates and teacher, who was so relieved to see I was safe. Anyway, School was cancelled indefinitely for the rest of that day, and about 30 minutes later, my dad picks me up. It wasn't until the next morning that everybody had received an email from the main office staff. Apparently, a couple of armed men had robbed a gas station across the street from our school. Police arrived just when the men were running out of the gas station, and that led them on a wild chase across the street to our high school. That's when I just so happened to have bumped into the men where police officers were just a short pace behind them. I'll never forget that day, and it goes down as one of the scariest moments of my entire life. This happened in the fifth grade in the year 2001, and to this day, nothing has really been able to top just how crazy of an event it was. That day, we finally had the opportunity to play outside, as the whole entire week it had been raining really heavily. Most of the field we ran on was still too muddy to try playing tag or soccer, which is why I myself and other students played on the basketball courts or on the playground jungle gym. I played a few rounds of basketball with the 6th graders, and then after I got my butt whooped in the scoring, I told them, good game, and then started to walk over to the jungle gym area. That's where I saw two of my other friends as they were playing jump rope, and I wanted to finally prove to them that I was the best. I guess as kids, the idea of competition was implanted in our heads. I mean, who doesn't like impressing the cute girl everyone has a crush on? As a side note, there was one time I had been doing a jump rope competition with my fellow classmates, and I pretty much ate the floor and tripped, falling face first on the concrete. Luckily, not any crazy damage to my face or anything, but I did scrape my arms as I came down to the floor to brace for the impact. Anyway, we were jump roping and laughing, having a good time for, I'd say, ten or so minutes, when our group happened to look toward our right, and that's when we heard somebody yelling at us. We were looking at a fencing that separates the school and the nearby neighborhood, by the way. It's this homeless, disheveled man that's just in underwear and shoes, and he's got a backpack on. He had a long, dirty blonde hair, a scar underneath his right eye, and some cheap tattoos on his left arm. 
He was making violent threats, saying he was going to kill everyone and that the government was secretly trying to kidnap him. It was really creepy and all the students stopped what they had been doing as everyone's just watching him. This rant of his with him stating violent threats and shaking the fence lasts for another 30 or so seconds until a teacher finally comes over and is telling all the students to head back to their classrooms. Of course, most students didn't listen as myself, my friends, and maybe about 70% of students just continued to watch. Some more teachers come over to finally get us to move, but that wasn't all it would take for us to move, because the guy suddenly does something truly insane. He takes off his backpack and then reaches in for something. One of the teachers says everyone get inside as a large knife is suddenly taken out. He now starts to climb over the fence and by this point everyone is at a pretty safe distance. As you'd expect, we now go into lockdown and it lasts for about 30 minutes as the police arrived and began searching for this crazy dude. I won't lie when I say those were some of the scariest 30 minutes of my entire life since at one point we could hear him near our door continuing to scream out a bunch of nonsense and saying he was going to kill everyone. When all was said and done, the cops had to shoot him, which unfortunately myself and some students saw firsthand from peeking out the window, and unfortunately for him, due to his injuries, he did later pass away in the hospital, which was relayed to us a bit later on. I did have to go to therapy for quite a while as seeing someone get shot at such a young age puts a heavy trauma and toll on your young mind. It's just so crazy because when I learned he had been on drugs, it made me wonder, just what kind of issues was that man going through? I mean, most people aren't just going to be taking some heavy duty drugs and then go to a school and try to stab people, unless, like I said, they are under the influence and are in a changed state of mind. If there is one good outcome, it's that no students were harmed, scared and traumatized out of our minds, sure, but safe all in all. By the way, this might not be part of my story, but I just wanted to say thank you to Mr. Creepy Fox for all he does. I know there might be days when it seems your recovery is at a standstill. I know myself, I broke my leg in a skiing accident a couple of years ago, and I was so impatient with the recovery time, but you're strong. Your body will heal, and we all believe in you. Keep fighting the good fight, my friend, and stay blessed. I'll never forget this field trip as it was the first time in my life, and I guess you could say in my fellow classmates' lives as well, where we felt genuine fear and this overall sensation of hopelessness. Now, I know what you might be thinking. What a way to start off my submission. And I guess you're sorta of right, but after you've heard about my scary story, you'll think, wow, that escalated very quickly. So for some context, I'm male, 27 years of age, just your typical dude who works a Monday to Friday job, comes home, plays video games with friends, sleep, rinse and repeat. Though I could tell you more about my life, instead I'm going to rewind the clock, back to a better time, the 6th grade. A time when life was a little bit more simple. No need for work or responsibilities, or even having to worry about your next paycheck. All you had to really worry about was just having your friends, homework, and Saturday morning cartoons. Anyway, this field trip I'm writing about was to a huge farm that one of the universities in my city owned. It featured many different species of animals, like goats, sheep, cows, pigs, chicken, you name it, and we learned about them through various workshops that were set around the fairgrounds. In total, it was roughly 30 students with a couple of teachers and of course the adults who were giving the lessons. At around lunchtime, roughly 1pm, we were given a 30 minute break to eat our packed lunches as well as being able to talk with our fellow friends at some of the tables. I sat alongside my friend Jessica who I'm actually still friends with today, and I recall us talking about Pokemon or something like that since we were huge fans at the time. While everything was peaceful and quiet, 
I remember there being some music being played over a radio, and we started to hear helicopters in the distance. At first, it wasn't really a big deal, but then suddenly, one of the adults at the farm came racing over and advised everybody to head into the large barn where we had just learned about farming. We weren't sure what was happening, but as we began to all race inside, we can see somebody running in the distance heading toward our area. He was followed by a bunch of police officers, and we could even see and hear a canine as well. Needless to say, we all hunkered down inside the barn, as we ended up hearing gunshots sound off. That was probably one of the scariest moments of our life, as any form of gunshots we heard up to that point came from movies or TV shows. After about 15 minutes of waiting in anticipation, and cops coming to our rescue, the all clear was given, and we ended up being allowed to exit. As it turned out, the police had been in pursuit of an armed robber, who had just robbed a jewelry store a little bit earlier. The thing is, the man had shot at the police officers, and the police officers had shot at him, but we did end up seeing in the news report a couple of days later that the man survived his injuries. But anyway, we did make it back to school safely that afternoon, and when my parents arrived, they ended up hugging me extra tightly. But could you really blame them? After all, it's not every day you're put in a situation such as this. So yeah, that's my retelling of the time that we went on lockdown while on a field trip. By the way, thanks for all the awesome scary stories videos, Creepy Fox. Keep up the great work, and I look forward to your next animation episode. I was going through a pretty interesting time in 2010. Apart from just starting college and being happy to be attending the university I always dreamed of, I felt as if I was missing something. Sure, my parents always strive for me to focus on my studies, but part of me wanted to get into the workforce. I blame this overachieving on my older brother, who went on to become a doctor. That's why I was very excited to hear that just a month after classes began, our university was going to be throwing a job fair. I had actually heard of it from fellow friends of mine, and they were able to secure themselves with awesome jobs. One friend got a job working as a park ranger, and another one is currently on his way to become a firefighter. As I was following in the steps of my brother in the medical field, I was one of the first to head to the huge auditorium in which the fair was being held. Music could be heard jamming out of big speakers, and crowds of students could be heard conversing of their bright and wonderful futures ahead of them. I appreciated the warm welcome a couple of students gave me when I entered the building, as I now began looking for the medical booths, which there were quite a few. I had thought about nursing, thus I went ahead and talked to a couple of students who were currently interning at a local hospital. They gave me all the information that I needed including a pamphlet and some business cards. I then left them my cell phone and email address. Once I left, I got stopped by a man asking me if I was looking for work. He was average looking. He was dressed in a business casual outfit, had slick back brown hair, and large glasses. Yeah, actually, I just finished talking with some of the people at the medical booth. I'm looking to become a nurse, I gleefully replied being filled with excitement from the music playing over the speakers and the overall positive energy around me. Is that so? That's incredible. I'm currently scouting for people that are interested in the medical field. Would you like to leave me your email and cell phone? This was where I made one of the most naive and most dumb decisions of my early adulthood, trusting a stranger with my phone number. Awesome. Here. Have a flyer, it's got a lot more information in case you're interested. Have a good afternoon. The man then walked away to speak with some other girls. Now, the flyer he had given me was questionable at best. It looked as if it was made from a template, with the only important detail being the logo for the company he apparently represented. It was called Jerry Myers Enterprises, a company that helps college students find work. Yeah, I hadn't heard of it either which was why later that evening in my dorm room, I tried to look it up, but I got no results. Hey, have you heard of this Jerry Myers Enterprises? 
Some man on campus gave me this flyer saying that he was recruiting people, I said to my roommate Skylar, who also had a look of confusion on her face. I can't say I have. Are you sure you didn't just type it incorrectly? No, nah, I'm pretty sure I did. I just tried a bunch of different spellings too, and I've got nothing. Confused out of her minds, both Skylar and I soon forget about the company, but that's until roughly a week or so later. This is where I found myself in bed watching Netflix on my laptop, and I was suddenly interrupted by a text message from an unknown number. Hey Lisa, how are you doing? It's been a while, hasn't it? Sorry, but I must not have your phone number. Who is this? I texted back, thinking perhaps I had deleted one of my friend's numbers on accident. Why you gotta be that way, Lisa? Seriously, after all that time we spent in high school, you're going to forget your best friend? I'm sorry, but I still don't know who this is. Can you just tell me? Just guess. I ended up texting back with a friend's name, and the number responded back almost immediately with confirmation. Bingo, this is Kelly. I haven't heard from you in a while, girl. I want to come visit you sometime. Now, just for some quick context. I mentioned Kelly because that was the name of one of my best friends that I had lost contact with. For months, I was hoping I could hear from her again, and it seemed as if this was the case. At least I thought. Sure, I'm currently at university. That's cool. What's your dorm number? Maybe you can let me visit you this weekend. I gave her the information and left it at that. Now fast forward a couple of days later to Saturday night. Kelly sends me a text message and asks me to meet her at a university's baseball stadium. I've got some food I brought. I was thinking maybe we could sit in the seats and watch this guy above and catch up on life. Awesome. Do you mind if I bring my friend Skylar with me? You'll love her. She's so funny. And she's really sweet too. Kelly texts me back in anger and now she says that she wanted to meet me there by myself. No, I just wanted to be the two of us. Please don't bring anyone else. This should be our time. That did kind of raise some alarms. Kelly was always of the mentality of the more the merrier, which I reminded her of. I got a response a few minutes later with Kelly telling me that she just really wanted it to be us two. Things were growing a bit odd, so I called her out on this, and I wanted to hear her voice. She didn't respond to that request. Instead, she messaged me back saying that she lost her voice, and she couldn't really talk. This was really starting to turn into quite the show, so I ended up bringing Skylar with me nonetheless. Now, the baseball stadium is all the way behind the university. Out there, you're really out of luck if you're trying to get someone's attention which really made me ponder why she wanted to meet up there of all places. I mean, why would she be so excited to show up to my dorm and then change her mind and ask me to meet her somewhere isolated and by myself? Eventually, we reached the outside of the baseball stadium and I text Kelly back. I'm here, Kelly. Where are you at? I thought I told you. No other people. Just you and me. I had enough. So I shouted out and said, Kelly, if you really want to see me, then just come out here already. Moments later, we got the shock of a lifetime. A figure begins to approach Skylar and I from behind the ticket booth. Kelly, is that you? The person approaching who had a hoodie covering their face reveals moments later that they were not who they claimed to be. Remember the man I met during the job fair? the one part of Jerry Meyer's enterprises? It was him. And worst of all, he took out a knife. Skylar and I went nope and run like the wind, screaming along the way as the creep now chases us. Once we were in a more lit up part of campus, we turned around only to see the man was now long gone. Naturally, we ended up calling the campus police and they did a search of the university, but they found nobody matching our description. A few weeks later, with the help of descriptions and eyewitnesses, police were able to find and arrest him a few states over after he tried to lure some other college students who were thankfully wise to catch on to his tricks. Edit. I contacted the real Kelly a few nights after both Skylar and I had that strange incident. This happening before he was caught, by the way. After reconnecting our friendship, 
I explained what had happened and she found the whole thing very bizarre. Her explanation was that he must have been waiting for me to give him enough information. That way he could pretend to be someone I knew when I gave him a name. From there, who knows what his plans were. But it is crazy to think that there are people out there that will go out of their way to try and get you. School Group Projects Can I start off by saying they can be super hit or miss? I've had times growing up when I would be put into a group and everyone was super passionate about their work and got it done in a timely fashion. Then you had those dumb groups where no one wants to do anything. You end up having to do all the work and to make it worse, you also end up with a low grade because the others didn't even try. I hate that in school and I really do wonder why they still grade like that. I mean, do they still do that? Anyway, this is where I found myself in 2007 in the 10th grade, when for our Spanish class, we were required to film a 3-5 to five minute infomercial of sorts in order to sell different products we had been assigned. We had to make an infomercial on selling a tennis set with the racket, the balls, and the clothing. The problem was, the three other students I was assigned to work with were all lazy and couldn't be bothered to want to meet up to record the video. As a requirement, we needed to all appear in the video in some sort of capacity. So wouldn't you know it, they all finally decided to meet up, literally the day before the project was due. Oh, and by the way, I was required to do the video editing since none of them knew how to do even that. Ugh, what it was like being paired with those popular kids. So anyway, we are on our high school campus Thursday afternoon at around 5 p.m. and we're filming our scenes in the school auditorium. It's just the four of us in there, including a janitor we saw mopping the floor towards the very back slash top of the large room. The auditorium is sort of like a movie theater, where the seats start at the bottom next to the stage and then go upward toward a booth and a walkway. That's where the janitor is. To the right of the stage, there are two bathrooms. Bear in mind, in the time we had gotten there, we never saw anyone enter or exit those bathrooms. This will be important in just a second, I promise. We were just getting through one of the funnier portions of the skit, which had us use a cutout board prop at the back of the stage. When I happened to look toward the restrooms, some really weird guy, who was definitely not a student, as he looked to be like in his early 40s, just walked out of the restroom, looking like a zombie. I'm not even trying to be mean here either. He just looked like one of the extras you would have seen out of The Walking Dead. Well, season one that is, when the actors weren't super crazy with all that zombie makeup, they looked a little bit more human. This guy definitely had seen his better days, but we thought maybe he was just some homeless guy or something who came in to use the restroom. Although why and how no one saw him walk on campus, and question him is beyond me. My high school was and is still is gated, and by 8 p.m. the gates were closed, but since there are still students and staff, technically anybody can walk onto campus. Nowadays, with all the shootings and whatnot, things have changed. Anyway, the guy just walks up on the stage and without any warning, starts to ask us if we had any weed or crack on us that we could share with him. I mean, I'm a straight edge kid back then and even now, not sure about those other classmates of mine, but surely we didn't have anything like that on us. We told him no, and then he just loses it. He starts to walk up to us and our group, freaked out as we begin to walk toward the stairs that leads you down to the seats. The guy is cursing at us, but by this point the janitor I mentioned earlier comes down to us and starts talking to the guy telling him to leave or he was going to be getting the police. One of my classmates, we will call her Erica in this story, asks the janitor if she should go get someone, and the janitor tells us to go get the campus police officer who normally hangs out by the front entrance. Erica heads over there, as it's myself and the others just watching at a distance. You need to leave. I'm asking you kindly. Please leave, the janitor said. The man didn't listen. Instead, he just starts to walk up the stairs. But now, something happens that sent chills down our spines. He subtly turns around and does a complete 180 
and puts his hand in his jacket pocket. He takes out his small pocket knife and then starts to approach the janitor, telling him he was going to kill him. Now here's the thing. The janitor isn't just any ordinary janitor. He was a retired marine veteran, and from what we later learn from him, he's dealt with tougher and scarier situations before. As he lunges at the janitor, who does get a cut on his arm, he does disarm the man and puts him into an arm hold. The janitor now kicks the knife away and tells us to quickly secure it, which we do. The on-campus police officer gets there about a minute later, and luckily they are able to get the man detained, as more officers arrived about 10 minutes later to back them up. By now, my dad had come to pick me up, and we ultimately decided to cancel the filming. An exception was made due to what happened, and we were given a few extra days to work on the project, which was pretty nice. We ended up getting a solid B on the project, which was not great, not terrible. By the way, please tell me one of you gets the not great, not terrible reference. You're awesome if you do. Anyway, the janitor ended up getting praised by the police officers and all the students and staff on campus, and every time I saw him, I always made sure to say hello to him and wish him a good day, since I never did before. So that's my school story. The time some guy, who I almost certainly knew was on drugs, asked us for crack, and then pulled the knife out on the janitor, but got his butt whooped in the process. For some context, this comes from the perspective of a female, who at the time was a freshman in high school. This was the fall of 2006. Speaking of which, I had just started this high school adventure in a completely different state, from California to Arizona, since my dad had been offered a better job opportunity. It sucked since I was leaving behind all my friends that I had known since elementary school and junior high school, and although we could call each other, it just wasn't the same. The first day of school was rough. Not knowing anyone, I kind of just kept to myself, although I did hit it off with some of the older students in my art class, which was one of my electives. We will call them Jasmine and Chelsea. They were both 16 years old. Over the coming days, we would talk more and more in class as we worked on our art projects together, and soon I started to hang out with a group of about 10 during lunch and after school. It was great. Finally, I wasn't feeling so alone in person. Fast forward a little under a month later, and it's the homecoming football game. Both Jasmine and Chelsea had invited me to go with them, and at about 7pm on Friday afternoon, once I'd gone home to change and take a shower, my dad drops me off at school and I meet up with the girls as we had to go grab some nachos and drinks from the little stands that were set up selling food. Jasmine was in front of both Chelsea and I ordering a churro, and as we talked, a middle-aged man came up to us and started to ask us how our night was going and if we had a favorite player. It seemed like just normal, friendly talk, so I didn't think much of it as I answered his questions, and he seemed to just smile and nod. I did ask him if he was here to see one of his kids playing or one of his kids was around, I don't know why I asked it, I just did. And now he tells us, Oh no, I'm just here to watch the game. I love football. It seemed alright, but I was starting to get a bit uncomfortable when I caught him staring at my chest and saying that I was really pretty. My friends told me that he was a creep, but whatever, he was now gone as he walked away. Fast forward about an hour later, and it's well into the football game. I was starting to get the urge to pee and told my friends I was going to be right back. Jasmine tells me she needs to go too, and so accompanies me down the stands toward the restrooms that are by the parking lot. There's lots of noise right now and plenty of people to walk past, so that's why I didn't really notice him until I bumped into him. Remember the guy from the line from earlier? Well, of all people, I bump into him, and he says, Oh, I missed you too. It's good to see you again. I could smell alcohol on his breath, and I once again caught him staring down at my chest. Bear in mind that no alcohol was sold here, so he clearly had started drinking, since I didn't smell alcohol on his breath when I had seen him originally. Where are you going? May I ask you? I didn't answer him. 
I just walked past him as his other friends got distracted and he now starts to follow Jasmine and I. Since I was so shy to say anything, Jasmine spoke up for me and said, She's not interested in you, pervert. Why don't you just leave? She said this so loudly, even over the noise that was going on around us. Everyone in the vicinity looked around and turned in our direction. This man's face turned red, and instead of just walking away, he tries to explain by saying, Ha ha, you two are funny. Wait until your mom hears about how you've been treating your dad. He grabs my arm and tries to pull me closer. I was disgusted and creeped out by this. He was trying to play it off by pretending to be our dad, but clearly he wasn't. Now, I could keep going on, but there's not much else to this story other than a couple of security guards did walk on over and escorted the man off the property after I pushed him off of me. He did act like a big man-child over being kicked out. People actually cheered at him being kicked out, which served him right for being such a creep. That was really it. I did go to a few more football games after that, but I never saw nor encountered that man again. I would really like to hope he learned his lesson and didn't try to continue to pick up high school girls, because that's just absolutely disgusting and totally creepy. Hey everyone, this is a quick programming note here from the creepy fox himself. This next story we're going to be covering goes over a bullying incident that happened to someone that our subscriber knew. It is a more serious story with some very real and scary results that will really open your eyes to how serious the bullying epidemic is. It can lead to some very serious consequences and as you'll hear in this story, it could have cost the lives of others. If you or someone you know is getting bullied, there is help. Talk to someone you can trust and seek that help. If, of course, this is a subject matter that you may find hurtful or disturbing, or that it might be too much for you to handle, please use the timestamps provided to skip this story. If this subject matter is okay with you, here is that story submission in its entirety. This was in 2003 when I used to live in my small town in Michoacan and I was in what would be equivalent to the 7th grade in the United States. I was friends, or I guess more like an acquaintance with, this really shy kid, who for my retelling I will refer to as Jose. He was the nerdy kid, like me, who enjoyed video games, cartoons, and reading comic books. Unfortunately, however, he would get bullied by the older kids, particularly those in the grade above us. One time we had finished PE class, and we were all in the locker room getting changed back into our regular clothing to start our day as we had it first thing in the morning. One of the upperclassmen bullies came up to him and pushed him into a locker, and then proceeded to steal his Game Boy Advance that his mom had bought him for his birthday. He started crying and the bullies laughed at him, but I went to his aid after I saw what happened, since I hadn't originally been there as I'd gone to the restroom. I was able to get the guys to back off and that was just one of the incidents that would lead to this one day. Another time it's lunch and Jose and I are eating lunch together. The same bullies came over and began teasing Jose about his weight before they threw a bunch of pan dulce at him and they said, eat up puerco. I felt so bad for Jose and while I did all I could to try and protect him, as did some of the other classmates who noticed what was happening. Jose never went to any teachers and told me not to tell anyone. But to this day, I regret not telling anyone sooner. Anyway, fast forward a bit of time since that incident and it's early morning about 30 minutes before PE class and the start of school. I'm sitting at a bench looking over notes for a quiz when at the corner of my eye I see somebody walking up to me. It's Jose and he's looking really paranoid. He's acting erratic. I asked Jose what was wrong and he whispers something into my ear that gave me chills. I brought my dad's gun and I'm going to shoot those bullies for all they put me through. As you would imagine, hearing a classmate say they have a gun is going to instantly send chills down your spine and raise some serious alarm bells. I now told Jose to knock it off and that if this was some sort of joke, he needed to stop. But then he opens his backpack and I see it. There is a revolver and a holster, 
and that's when I realized that Jose was being dead serious. But what could I do? Was I just going to reach for it, grab it, and then go get a teacher? I had to try. I tried reaching for his backpack when he turns his back to me, and he says, Don't interfere, man. I don't want you to get hurt. He now grabs the gun, which was loaded by the way, drops the backpack, and runs into the locker room. I at this moment, I still don't know why I did this to this day, adrenaline I guess, I decided to run after him, putting my own life on the line. I was shocked to see that in the locker room, those same bullies had already been there. I guess they had entered from the other side of the building. Jose, don't! Jose then fires all six shots in the direction of the bullies as they take cover. By some miracle of God, apart from one of them being grazed in the arm by one of the bullets, none of them were hit. In that moment, a PE teacher turned the corner and without any sort of reluctancy, Jose drops the revolver and the teacher manages to grab the revolver from the ground. Teachers and staff were called over, and as you'd expect, so were the police. Jose was taken in for questioning as the student who had been grazed in the arm got treated for his injury. Everyone involved in the incident, including myself, had to talk to a counselor afterward, which did help me since I was really traumatized by the whole thing. Those bullies were all suspended from school for a week. And as for Jose, he was taken out of that school after that incident. Since I didn't have his phone number, as I didn't really talk to him other than just at school, I never did learn what happened to him. There were rumors he got put into a mental hospital, and other rumors that he served a sentence for what he did, but again, I never got a definitive answer. If I can wrap up my story submission here, it's going to be with this. Please don't bully anyone. And also, please speak up if you or someone you know is being bullied. I'm not saying that bullies shouldn't get punished for their actions. But those jerks definitely deserve more than a suspension. By the way, after that day, they were completely changed and never bullied anyone again. But I do believe they shouldn't have had their lives at risk. At least, that's how I see it. I don't know. What are your thoughts on this? Might not be the scariest thing you've probably heard on the Creepy Foxes channel before. But if you were in my shoes, seeing someone fire a gun at other human beings, it's sure to leave you with a bit of trauma. Hey Creepy Fox, I found your channel a few weeks ago thanks to a friend of mine, and I was wanting to share my scary experience with you and your listeners. I want to take you back to when I was in the second grade. This was the fall of 2000, and takes place in my small hometown in Oregon. At the time, Pokemon was extremely popular. Kids would bring their Pokemon cards for trading, as well as their Game Boys. That way kids could battle one another and trade. The teachers naturally weren't a really big fan of this, so we usually had to play during recess or lunch, or even after school. That was where I found myself on a Friday afternoon, as I was waiting for my mom to pick me up. Since I still recall my dad had been away on a business trip, as he was usually the one to come get me from school. I was with my two friends, James and Kevin, and we were at the lunch tables in the middle of our school's campus as I watched Kevin and James battling each other on their Game Boys. Other kids were staying after school as they were on the basketball court playing and I even recall some younger students were with their parents playing on the jungle gym. As we were in the middle of our after school hangout, I told my friends I was going to be right back since I wanted to go use the restroom. To get to the nearest restrooms where we were currently located, I had to walk to the nearby school library, to the right of us, then toward the back of that building, which faces the small parking lot. This is important to mention because when I turned the corner of the library building, a middle-aged overweight man, around 300 pounds, 5 foot 10 or so, walks out of a white SUV, and then starts to approach my direction. I didn't really mind him too much in that moment as I head into the restroom to pee. However, while I'm in the stall, I heard the restroom door open, then footsteps that went quiet. I found this a bit odd, but I assumed it was the guy I just saw coming to take a leak as well. Anyway, I finished up, and as soon as I opened the stall door, the man comes out of the corner of my eye, 
and then asks me if my parents were around. I found his questioning a bit odd, but I humor him as I start to wash my hands and say I was with my friends. He then asks where they were, to which I told them they were by the benches, but it was just me here at the moment. Big mistake. I saw him smirk at that response, as if this was all calculated, and right as I'm about to pass him, he stops me by walking in front of the door and says something along the lines of, Wait, before you leave, I gotta ask you, do you remember who I am? Bear in mind, I've never seen or heard of this guy ever before in my life, so I just tell him, Nah, I don't know who you are. Perhaps you might be mistaking me for someone else. He lets out an awkward laugh and responds back by saying, Don't you remember? I'm a friend of your dad's from work. By the way, he told me to come get you. He was busy. I'll buy you an ice cream. My treat. Busy was an understatement. He was on a business trip, and I highly doubted that my mom wasn't going to be picking me up like she originally said she was going to do. You have to remember that while cell phones were just starting to roll out, very slowly, most kids didn't have access to one. I was no exception, so my mom's word would be final. I told the man that I would wait for my mom instead and then try to push past him, but he blocks my way and starts to act very bizarrely. I was starting to get a bit freaked out and told him I wanted to leave and then once again he urges me that he was here to pick me up. I tell him I wanted to leave and now he steps aside for a brief moment. I finally think that this strange little incident was over, but I am snapped out of this reality when I feel a tug on my arm, and then I am quite literally picked up off my feet. This man has a hold of me, and I remember everything going into slow motion, and all the noise around me going quiet. There is a word for this sensation of silence and slow motion, but I can't really think of it right now. It really is something I never wish upon anyone, even my worst enemies. We were now starting to head toward the direction of his vehicle, and even though I am struggling to get away, I just couldn't let out any noise. It's like my mouth would open, but no noise would come out. I hated it. I felt so powerless. Finally though, what gets me out of that funk was when I could see my friends running toward this man and I. All of a sudden it's like a switch flickered back on and all the noise came back. I was also able to let out a loud scream and in that moment I remember the Game Boy that's in my pocket. I managed to secure it and then as hard as I could, with no mercy, hit this man square on in the nose with said Game Boy. He now lets go of me as the batteries fall out of the Game Boy and I could see he's now holding his nose as there is some blood starting to come out. I happen to notice in this moment as two adults are running in our direction who just so happen to have seen what was taking place. Before they could get too close however, the man jumps into his car and storms out of that parking lot, leaving me in a pile of my own tears. Well, not literally, but you get the idea. Speaking of ideas, I had no idea in that moment but I was having a full-on panic attack, and the two adults, one of them who happened to have been a nurse, is able to comfort me. My mom did eventually arrive about 15 minutes later, around the time she said she would get there, and the police were already there taking statements. The cops told me that they would make sure to catch the guy who tried to take me, and let's just say they didn't disappoint. We later found out that the man had not only been found, but arrested on multiple other charges. He was later released, but he was added to a list of known predators. But perhaps the worst part was that I learned he only lived about 5 minutes away from my house. How I had never seen him before, I'm not too sure. But then again, we never had any reason to go into that neighborhood. It's safe to say that that afternoon, he had plans to kidnap me, and what he was going to do is everyone's guess. I'm just glad that I never heard from him ever again, and I seriously hope no one has ever had to go through something like this. There is no other scary feeling like feeling overpowered and being taken by force by a man with sick intentions.
Hello creepy fox. I've been listening to your stories videos for around two years now and I saw that you needed stories and knew of one story that I haven't shared with you yet. It was third period, study hall, Wednesday afternoon. Normally it would be a 20 minute homework session and 20 minutes of gaming. Regardless, there was a span of threats that happened to neighboring schools in my region. I recall being on my Chromebook when suddenly the dean comes over the loudspeaker. Hello, we're going into a lockdown in place. Please stay calm and go to the nearest classroom. Now this was weird because our dean usually tells us if it's something like a medical emergency for a student or something along those lines, but nothing. No clarification. Had there been something that happened that he didn't want to share? Well, about 15 minutes pass and we're just chilling on the Chromebooks until my classmate says, Hey Ryan, you see that van over there? I look and there's a big black Mercedes-like van that Amazon drivers would deliver in. This was far from an Amazon driver. Well, nothing happened until my friend screams. Oh god, all we heard were two sets of gunshots and a car booking it. The dean now came back on about an hour later and he gave us a brief statement that the lockdown was now over and that we were to go home. Later that day, walking home, my friend said his teacher told them that a man in black clothing took two shots at a window and then booked it. I don't think the man was caught, but I still wonder, was the man there for revenge? Or was he there for another intent? We still don't know, all these years later. Hey, since you made it this far into the video, I wanted to go ahead and include a bonus school scary story. It doesn't involve a school lockdown, but it is school related, and it's pretty crazy. Here's how it goes. It's normal for students to get into the occasional tussle. It's what separates the men from the boys, and at the end of it, both you and whoever you're arguing with will laugh it off and earn each other's respect. But unfortunately, this isn't always the case. Such is a very real and scary encounter I had during my high school years. It was back in the late 1990s, during my freshman year. I was who you would best describe as the nerdy kid, the one who enjoyed comic books and video games. Sadly, this meant that I would get picked on by the guys on the football team calling me a bookworm, amongst other nicknames. Something that did surprise me was that a lot of my fellow students enjoyed talking to me. Maybe it was because of my laid-back attitude and overall nice persona, but I think this was what got me into trouble. I remember I was waiting in line for lunch when I accidentally bumped into someone and I recognized him right away. It was one of the seniors from the football team, who in this story we will call Robert. Oh look, it's the bookworm from third period. Watch where you're going, kid. I apologized, explaining that there were so many people pushing to the front of the line and that I had been pushed by somebody else, which caused me to bump into him. That apparently, however, wasn't enough to settle his rage, and he walks off. Fast forward to later that afternoon, when the final bell rings. I met up with a couple of my friends, and we decided to head to the park across the street so that we could play Game Boy Color together. As we're reaching the back gate of our high school, I saw a familiar face. Remember that Robert dude I mentioned? The one from the football team? He was back, and he looked very angry. Hey kid, I think I changed my mind. I was going to let you go, but now you're in for it. He puts his fists up in a boxing position, and now tells me to come at him. A crowd suddenly forms and they begin cheering for Robert. Great, here I was, this skinny but tall nerdy kid with glasses about to duke it out with Mr. Buff Football Star. What other choice did I have? If I were to run, everybody was going to laugh and I would be the laughing stock of the school. So instead, I decided to fight. I drop my backpack and I begin to approach him as he starts to shadow box. In that moment, I thought of all the matches I'd seen up to that point from WWF, also known as WWE today. Now, I know it's scripted and people give it a hard time, but the moves themselves are very much real, 
which means if you don't perform the moves correctly, you could cause yourself some serious harm. Just look up some matches with The Undertaker and Mankind for example, and you'll instantly get some results of what I'm talking about, that one Hell in a Cell match. But anyway, I digress. The point I'm trying to get at here is that I did take a couple of blows, but during an opening, I was able to perform the Diamond Cutter from my then favorite wrestler, Diamond Dallas Page. The move requires you to leap backward into the air and catch your opponent's head and neck. It's similar to the RKO Randy Orton performs. Anyway, with the momentum, you both come crashing down to the ground. You take the bump on your back, while the person receiving the move gets the bump in the face. Well, let's just say Mr. Football Star was caught off guard and got more than he bargained for because I ended up rearranging his nose. Ouch. Everyone now started to cheer for me and I thought it was finally over. But as if things couldn't get any more scarier, he takes out a pocket knife and tries to take a swing at me. I dodged out of the way and finally some teachers took notice to what was happening. Robert now backs up and then tells him that I was the one who came after him, but the teachers didn't believe him since they knew that he was a troublemaker. Luckily, all the students in the group took my side and they said that Robert had started the fight and I was simply defending myself. Well, needless to say, Robert was suspended and then later expelled when he tried breaking into the principal's office. In there he tried to grab his report card so his parents wouldn't see his grades. Yeah, our principal was pretty savage, and she didn't take any of his nonsense. The crazy part with this whole thing is that Robert was sent to jail a few years later as he was connected with a series of home break-ins. It's now been over 20 years, and I'm happily married to my beautiful wife Rose, and we have two wonderful kids. I still call them kids, even though they just started high school a year ago. By the way, I continue to watch wrestling, and so do my kids. It's a tradition I've kept all these years later.